Thank you very much. Thanks to all the participants and to all who will be watching this in the coming days. Uh, we're very lucky to have some of the uh, global leaders in health systems and in public health to reflect on the ongoing pandemic and the recommendations of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. We issued the final report of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission on September 14th of this year. Uh, the pandemic was not over, but the Commission is uh, finishing this year uh, with recommendations uh, based on the lessons learned during uh, these uh, three years of the pandemic. And uh, we, for purposes of our discussion today, a central focus is the reflection uh, throughout the report of the Commission that functioning health systems are the sine qua non of uh, an effective response to a pandemic and of course to multiple other health challenges that are faced by every part of the world. A uh, health system entails two interrelated but distinct components. Uh, the components of uh, medical response, uh, curative health, uh, clinical, uh, uh, clinical response at all levels uh, from nurses, doctors, and community health workers to hospital services. And the other pillar of a health system is the public health system. Uh, that is the epidemiology, the surveillance capacity, and the ability in a trusted manner to convey to the broad population uh, health uh, recommendations to protect populations uh, in the midst of multiple kinds of crises, whether it's uh, endemic disease, or whether it is a, a, a pandemic, uh, as we have confronted in the last three years, uh, or whether it is the challenges of seasonal flu or countless other uh, areas of health where the relationship between health experts and the public is essential, a trusting relationship is essential, and of course a high quality cotter of uh, experts uh, is indispensable. Let me review very briefly uh, core recommendations of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission with regard to health system strengthening because our conclusion was that many parts of the world lacked one or the other of these two pillars of clinical health or of public health and some parts of the world are uh, bereft of both pillars, in part because of chronic poverty, which in turn is reinforced by the poor public health conditions of the population. So if you'll permit me, I'll just review briefly some of the core recommendations of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. And I'm happy to say that in a recent uh, workshop with the World Health Organization leadership, uh, we had a very, very good discussion as well on these critical issues. So I will uh, briefly share my screen uh, and um, let's see if I can, oops, close that and do that and go back to the beginning. So building strong health systems recommendations of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission, three uh, broad recommendations that I want to highlight. First, countries should strengthen national health systems on the foundations of public health and universal health coverage grounded in human rights and gender equality. And then we describe what these two facets of a health system, the public health system and the health coverage system entails. I won't go into the details in this brief introduction, but this uh, PowerPoint and of course the uh, commission report itself are available online and this entire uh, workshop today will of course be 
taped and available online for further study. In addition to strengthening health systems, we recommend that each country should determine and expand the national pandemic preparedness plans to prevent and to respond to newly emerging infectious diseases. Sad to say, but COVID-19, of course, will not be the last of the pandemics that we face uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, the world will continue to experience new emerging infectious diseases uh, and no doubt uh, some of them as dangerous and serious as the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which has been afflicting us with the pandemic and which has claimed an estimated 18 million lives to date. There will be others. We could say that most countries were not prepared for this pandemic. They did not have preparedness plans in place. Uh, many, many countries were unable for a variety of reasons, all, uh, all resulting from a lack of preparedness to respond effectively to the pandemic. And that is indeed why the pandemic uh, has uh, continued with such force with the arrival of new variants and with such a shockingly high level of deaths worldwide. The third recommendation that I want to highlight is the financial dimension of an effective health system. Of course, for high income countries, the basic question is, uh, is choosing to use the high levels of income uh, in uh, the country in, in a propitious manner to properly fund the two pillars of the health system. For a low income country, however, this is not merely a national choice because poor countries simply do not have the public revenues that are necessary to be able to maintain and sustain a proper public health system. And so for this purpose, we recommend establishing a new global health fund that should be closely aligned with WHO. This fund should combine and expand on the operations of several existing health funds, such as the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, or the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, and should include the new pandemic preparedness and response funding, which is just getting underway. And in addition to those three windows, we strongly urge a fourth window of financing, which truly does not exist properly in the world today. And that is funding for poor countries to be able to train and deploy health workers at an adequate level to maintain an effective national health system. Shockingly, there is no established mechanism for funding the health workforce that is essential for global public health. Let me very briefly uh, summarize a, a few points. Even before the pandemic, the span of life expectancy from the poor countries to the rich countries was a shocking 30 years. Even before the pandemic, the poor countries in sub-Saharan Africa have life expectancies in the mid 50s, whereas the high income countries in Northern Europe and in East Asia have life expectancy in the mid 80s. This is a shocking fact because the excess deaths in the low income countries are from identifiable and preventable or treatable causes. And not only that, preventable and treatable at quite low cost. But poor countries are too poor on their own to be able to mobilize effective health systems. And one of the facets of that is simply the lack of health workers. In the poorest countries in Africa, there are two or three doctors 
per 100,000 population, two or three per 100,000. Whereas in the high income countries, there are five or six doctors per thousand population. So it's more than a hundred times gap between the poor countries and the rich countries in doctors per person. In terms of health expenditures, we also have a gap of a hundred times. In the low income countries, health outlays are 60 or 70 or $80 per person for an entire year. Whereas in the high income countries, they are five or six or $7,000 per person per year. In other words, a hundred times larger. And when you factor in the uh, realization that much of the spending in poor countries is private, indeed out of pocket spending, not public spending, which is the most effective kind of health system spending, the gap in expenditures is even larger. If you statistically analyze where does money matter, it's in public outlays for the health system much more than in the private out of pocket outlays. And I run through one example of a a very poor country like Chad or Malawi or Niger at $600 per capita, typically the public spending in such a country is on the order of 18 or $20 per capita because that's all there is in the budget. And that means that it's one 200th or 300th of what is spent in a high income country. And what the evidence shows us is that even small increments of spending per capita, raising that level from say $18 to four times that amount, $72 per capita, still tiny compared to the high income world, could add five years of life expectancy by addressing the causes of maternal death at uh, pregnancy and childbirth, the deaths of infants and children under the age of five because of lack of immunization or doses of uh, anti-malarials or other uh, low-cost interventions that have a tremendous, uh, tremendously important uh, uh, life-saving feature. So our estimates are that we need an increment of perhaps one-tenth of one percent of the GDP of the high-income countries. That would be $60 billion a year. And that would raise the life expectancy and the functionality of the health systems of the low-income countries in remarkable ways. And for that, as I've mentioned, and I'll close here, our recommendation is for a global health fund led by the World Health Organization that combines the Global Fund, Gavi, Pandemic Preparedness, and Primary Health System Strengthening and Finance, so that we have the capacity to respond not only to pandemics, but to the year in, year out, life-threatening conditions that are causing so much excess uh, disease burden and so much tragic and unnecessary loss of life in the poorer countries of the world. So now we're going to hear from uh, remarkable experts who have been in the front lines of uh, the battle of the pandemic. And I'm really grateful to you for joining today and really want to hear your uh, takeaways, your lessons, uh, having been in this battle for three years of what you see, what we really need to do. We need to advocate together. We're on <laughs> one dramatic mission to help uh, the world learn the lessons of this pandemic, which still is not over, but in order to really come out of this, at least, at least with the saving grace of strengthened health systems around the world. So with that, I will turn it back over to you, Julie, and thank you for moderating the session. And thanks to all the esteemed uh, public health leaders who are going to be uh, discussing uh, these issues uh, with us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for your remarks.
Um, first, I would like to welcome Dr. Andrea Amon, di Director of the European CDC, to speak about the lessons learned regarding health system strengthening from uh, strength, health system strengthening from the European experience of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, Dr. Amon has been the director of the European CDC since 2017 and brings her many years of experience in national disease surveillance and outbreak response to current and emerging infectious diseases in Germany to this webinar. Thank you very much, Dr. Amon, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I don't know how many time zones are assembled here. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who listens. Um, I think it's very important um, uh, to, to look now what can we learn from this, because as Professor Sachs has said, I mean, it was a, or still is, a, a devastating uh, three years that we have behind us. Um, uh, on the other hand, it also has uh, highlighted where we have to improve. Um, and um, uh, many of the lessons that we have learned uh, are in line with what the uh, Lancet COVID-19 Commission has, has highlighted. Um, just a word to uh, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control. As um, the name says, we are uh, in charge, our core group uh, of countries in charge is the European Union, uh, characterized as high income countries. And nonetheless, we see, or even in our um, uh, region, uh, uh, a span of differences and inequities in life expectancies, in incomes, and in possibilities and capabilities. Um, so um, our, our remit is infectious diseases to identify, uh, analyze, and assess, communicate um, uh, threats from infectious diseases. And my, my, my lessons are, of course, based on, 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 this, on this remit. So what we have um, learned is that in the future, to, to deal better with situations like this, um, we have to uh, develop preparedness that is transferable from 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 uh, between different between different threats, and uh, as we have seen, uh, not only includes the health sector, but is multi-sectoral um, and multidisciplinary. Uh, so one health is for, uh, written all over uh, the the lessons that we have seen, and I think that is uh, very much in line with uh, what the Commission has has put forward. Um, now. Um, being one of the richest uh, uh, regions in the world, uh, our preparedness should have uh, shown the way in how to deal with uh, the, the, the pandemic, but uh, the preparedness plans were not up to this. Uh, also in our region, basically every country has recognized they were not prepared. Um, and uh, one of the big areas where we will invest in the in the in the coming years is the resilient modernization of the surveillance systems because uh, although uh, the data is not everything uh, everything starts from there um, and that is why um, uh, we we uh, start now modernizing and as much as we can uh, the, the uh, European uh, system, surveillance system, but also then support the countries in um, uh, uh, transforming their systems. In terms of preparedness plans, I mean, uh, the Commission has outlined uh, very much so the, the uh, key ingredients. Uh, for me, the learnings are a bit more specific. Um, uh, in, in addition to the cross-sectoral preparedness um, uh, uh, plan, um, we also need to pay attention on the cross-border issues. We have many regions where people live on one side of the border and work on the other side. And we have uh, uh, witnessed very difficult situations when countries on both sides decided to do different things uh, without any, any, any prior notice. Um, I also uh, believe that the local level needs particularly strengthening in both in the primary care and the public health because they are at, they bear the brunt. They see the first and they see the worst. 
um, and without their resilience, everything else is 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 um, uh, at at risk. Uh, particularly, uh, particular care uh, and attention should be paid to the hospital pre preparedness at all levels, in terms of surge capacity for beds, but also for staffing. Um, I mean. Throughout the countries, uh, there were solutions found, uh, but it took some time and it was not pre-thought, uh, which I think uh, a preparedness plan should do. Um, the other element for the hospital preparedness is the stockpiles. I think we have seen in particular at the beginning of the pandemic that uh, uh, essential uh, elements have been missing in equipment, in ventilators, in personal protective equipment, but also in medicines, in the general medicines for ICU, for instance. Um, now, for me, one of the most critical learnings is the value and um, uh, the, the emphasis that needs to be given to risk communication and community engagement. We have um, lost uh, the community, our general population, along the pandemic, um, uh, they were uh, very adherent to the measures at the beginning, and uh, uh, throughout the three years, we lost them. And I think it was um, uh, that we that we haven't the communication and the engagement to the change of the phase and the the context of the pandemic. Uh, so here for me, we have to uh, really do a lot because the coming threats that we can already see in terms of, for instance, global warming and climate change, we need the population, everybody has to do their part. And if we don't engage properly, uh, it will not happen. Now, uh, based on all these learnings, we have um, uh, uh, the, the legislator in the EU have put forward revisions of our legal mandate. Uh, that um, will require us to change a few things. Um, it uh, will ta uh, tasks us to work more closely with the countries, have a more um, um, interactive uh, um, uh, dialogue with the countries and not treat them as a blob in the region, but really also on an individual basis. Uh, so the surveillance um, um, strengthening, I have already said, but it is also helping countries uh, to um, uh, 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 monitor and assess how their health systems are doing. To agree and build indicators for the countries, with the countries uh, that uh, allow them and us to assess where are they in the, uh, are they in the preparedness because so far we have to rely on the, them saying oh yeah we are prepared which didn't turn out to be true uh, there are other th uh, um, elements that turned out to be very important during the pandemic and that is the modeling and the foresight we have um, started the pandemic with one modeler which was woefully inadequate of course uh, now we have four with two more to come. And they have now built with other modeling teams, uh, forecasting hubs where the modeling teams can, can, can bounce their ideas for the shorter term forecasting, uh, scenario hubs for the midterm forecasting. And we have started uh, this year a, a foresight project that looks really 10, 15 years. What are the drivers uh, in the uh, future that might um, impact what kind of threats come? Because that can also uh, then direct which um, way the preparedness uh, um, uh, can go. Um, we will uh, also intensify our global uh, collaboration. We have already started in 2019, shortly before the pandemic, to develop a network of the CDCs around the, uh, around the world that proved very helpful um, uh, because um, colleagues in areas that were already dealing early with the, uh, with the uh, uh, pandemic could tell us, others, uh, how they did, and we could learn from them. We also saw that we all had the same questions, what are the masks, are the schools, and this and that. 
and and by exchanging the views um, I'm not sure we, 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 we achieved an alignment, but that could also be used for um, a, a, a sort of a principle alignment um, uh, uh, that, that uh, could help um, uh, around, around the world. We have been even more closely than before working with our colleagues in WHO Euro. Many of the documents that we have, uh, uh, guidance documents that we have prepared are um, uh, done together with them. Um, and we have received a, a grant for working uh, and strengthening uh, the Africa CDC. So that is a particular focus now also for our, for our work. So concluding, um, I think we have a lot of um, uh, work also in our region to do. Um, we uh, saw the, 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 the advantage to be connected globally. Uh, for the um, for, for for dealing with the crisis, but also now we have to continue this for the for the uh, preparedness, and um, um, we from our side this this partnership that we that we have within the or want to have within the EU, but also globally, should be really based on the principles of solidarity and equity. Um, uh, that that these inequalities that still exist in our region and globally uh, can be can be uh, uh, reduced. Now this is of course um, uh, um, uh, based on on trust uh, and uh, consistency that has to be built uh, not in a crisis but afterwards uh, or, or in between um, uh, beca because uh, uh, the what we have seen is that no single continent no region uh, uh, and definitely can deal with such a crisis on its own we have to all work together thank you happy to have any questions thank you so much dr ramon you, for your very insightful remarks and in the spirit of sharing views from different global regions um it's my pleasure to now introduce Dr. James Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald, the Director of the Health Systems and Services Department at the Pan American Health Organization, or PAHO. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald oversees PAHO's work on health systems and services organization oriented towards universal health. Thank you very much, Dr. Fitzgerald, for sharing your insights and reflections on health system strengthening from the uh, Latin American region. Thank you, um, and a very good morning to you from, from Washington. Um, let me start by thanking Professor Sachs and, and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the Center for Sustainable Development uh, for organizing the, the, this webinar on health system strengthening. Uh, it really re represents an opportunity for us, I think, to reflect on some of the main challenges and opportunities that uh, within our context, the region of the Americas is facing to introduce uh, real substantive and transformational change in our health systems with strategies that build resilience, but underpinned by values of equity, solidarity, and most importantly, uh, the right to health. Um, we at PAHO, we welcome the recommendations of the Lancet Commission, uh, the, its final report, and we celebrate the global perspective and intersectoral composition of the recommendations being proposed. This is a fundamental condition to uh, develop greater resiliency in the health systems but more so to recover the lost public health gains that we've witnessed over the last three years. PAHO is playing and continues to play a, a key role in supporting our member states in responding to the global crisis in the Americas. And we are working intensively now with our countries in building sustainable and long-term strategies for the post-pandemic period. But it's within this context that I'd like to present um, some observations on the context of health and health systems prior to the pandemic and how that context impacted the capacity of the region to respond during the pandemic. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, the region of the Americas was making steady progress towards the achievement of universal health coverage, but systemic deficiencies and inequalities persisted and gains were overall slow. For example, if we look at the SDG 3.8 target on service coverage, we see that it was improving as shown by the UHC service coverage index from 65 in 2000 to 77 in 2019. And the Americas was the third highest average value across WHO regions. In addition, between 2000 and 2017, 
the Americas was the only WHO region that experienced reductions in the incident of catastrophic and impoverishing health spending. But despite this progress, inequalities in service coverage persist, and about a third of the population continue to face multiple barriers to access health services, a situation that was more prevalent amongst vulnerable populations. While public spending is slowly improving, spending was still insufficient and low priority has been given to investments of the first level of care. This is relevant because prioritizing our first level of care is really a necessary condition to improve the resolution capacity and provide quality health services to people and communities. The deficit of human resource for health in the Americas is enormous. It remains unacceptably high. We estimate that we will need approximately 600,000 additional health professionals in the region of the Americas to be able to recover the lost public health gains and retake the path to achieve the health-related SDGs by 2030. So in summary, the COVID-19 pandemic has reserved, reversed progress made toward the achievement of universal health coverage over the past 20 years, exposing and exacerbating structural weaknesses of health systems and health inequalities. The response to the pandemic has been limited by the historical weaknesses of the region's health systems, additionally compounded by the long prevailing structural inequities and social, uh, social exclusion and the lack of adequate financing. The challenges of segmentation and fragmentation of health systems, characterized by weak stewardship and governance mechanisms, reflected in the poor systems performances even before the pandemic. As a result, simply maintaining the continuity of essential health services while responding to the pandemic was a challenge in our region. In December of last year, nearly all countries in the region reported disruptions to essential health services, with 93% of 28 countries reporting disruptions of at least one essential health service. During that time, these, was, these disruptions were reported across all health service delivery platforms, with the first level of care and community-based care services amongst the most effective. The pandemic has led to shortages and inequities in access to essential medicines and other health technologies as well, limiting and jeopardizing the delivery of, a, of essential health services. It further has revealed the dependence of Latin America and the Caribbean on imports of medicines and other health technologies from outside the region, the vulnerability of global supply chains and emergencies, and the high degree of heterogeneity in the Americas in terms of COVID-19 vaccine research, development, and production capacity. So the region of the Americas really urgently needs to act to reverse the socioeconomic and health losses caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and to address the critical issue of foregone care and recover lost public health gains. The pandemic reaffirms that the strategy around universal access to health and universal health coverage based on the primary health care approach constitutes and remains the foundation for resilience in health systems that have the capacity to prefer, prepare for and respond effectively to crises, to maintain core functions when a crisis hits, and to reorganize and transform if conditions require it. Given this, we at PAHO are working with our member states to accelerate and expand coordinated action between social sectors to promote systemic transformation. In 2021, our countries adopted a strategy for building resilient health systems and post-COVID-19 pandemic recovery to sustain and promote public health gains. This strategy has four critical lines of action. These lines of action call for first, transforming health systems based on the foundation of primary health care. Second, strengthening leadership, stewardship and governance through a renewed focus on the essential public health functions. Third, strengthening capacities of health service delivery networks. And finally, increasing and sustaining public financing in health and social protection. In addition, our countries have called for renewed efforts to increase research and innovation for vaccines, medicines, and other health technologies, strengthening regulatory systems, and promoting greater region-wide integration and solidarity in these efforts. And they are seeking to leverage the power of digital health to accelerate all transformations. This framework, we believe, provides us with a path moving forward, and our approach constitu constituted the foundation for the Action Plan on Health and Resilience adopted by our heads of state at the Ninth Summit of the Americas in June, Los Angeles in the United States. At the summit, PAHO and the United States government announced within this context the launch of the Americas Health Corps as one of the strategic efforts to build a regional cadre of health workers that we need to address public health needs 
and to be better prepared for future international public health emergencies. And so as we continue to mitigate the effects of COVID-19, countries in the Americas are already envisioning a post-COVID-19 development era that will need to build and embed resilience within societies and health systems. Countries will need to prioritize the strengthening of health systems towards the achievement of universal access to health and universal health coverage, but of course, embedding pandemic preparedness and response as a key component. Barriers to access, fragmentation and segmentation in health systems must be addressed through coherent policy reform and progressive integration of subsystems if the goals of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development are to be achieved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Fitzgerald, for your presentation. Next, we are very lucky to be joined by Ms. Pauline Oringu, who serves as the Global Policy and Advocacy Advisor for PATH, where she leads PATH's advocacy for equitable access to quality maternal, newborn, and child health. Previously, Ms. Oringu served as the Advocacy and Policy Country Lead for Kenya, and she brings nearly two decades of leadership in public health advocacy, policy, and engagement with governments in the African region to, to advocate for stronger policies and investments in women and children's health. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, so by, just to start off, let me start off by painting a picture of what has happened in Africa when COVID-19 hit. As, as we are all aware, Africa has very weak healthcare systems, whether you look at it from uh, primary healthcare or, or you look at it from um, tertiary care. One thing that stood out is how much Africa is left out of global supply chains and really stood far behind other countries and was really unable to access essential products, medical products, whether you think about PPEs or masks, it took a really long time for Africa to access um, this. Secondly is the issue of inequities in the international health systems that were really amplified and characterized by vaccine inequity in Africa. Till date, there are many countries that have not even achieved vaccination of two million people. Um, despite having large populations, while in other parts of the world, especially in developed countries, um, people are now doing third and fourth doses of vaccine, while many Africans are standing in line waiting. The other challenge is that while Africa experienced low uh, deaths compared to other regions of the world, the impact of COVID-19 on health systems, on social development and economy remains enormous and really Issues such as gender have become, gender concerns have become more amplified. And something to note is that although the deaths that are reported are low, there are many, many missed deaths and many COVID infections that went unreported due to weak data systems on the continent. COVID-19 did erode a lot of gains that African countries had made in essential health services whether you think about uh, reproductive maternal and child health, care for NCDs, uh, response to other infectious diseases, those have really taken a hit. In some countries, you had a point, 10 point percentage reduction in vaccination services for children um, in, in 2020 compared to other times. So these all show how much uh, Africa has taken a huge hit due to COVID. In, in 19, if you compare 2019 and 2020, the number of zero dose children on immunization increased by a 0.6 percentage point. Um, if you look at uh, DPT1 and DPT3 on the African region, this just as an example that shows how much um, regression has happened on essential health services on a continent that's really been struggling to keep up. Um, another impact of COVID-19 was uh, the channeling of resources as well as reorientation of health uh, services. When COVID-19 hit African countries, many governments changed and channeled resources to the pandemic response, leaving essential health services exposed to lack of inadequate financing. And yet these services were already struggling. An example of a country like Kenya, you had a diversion of about 9.4 million US dollars that were designed, designated for primary health care being channeled to support the COVID-19 response. Although governments in African countries have devoted a lot of their limited health budgets to PHC, 
uh, the need exists, the funding, and therefore systems remain weak. When you think about uh, what the Lancet Commission did show, and we really now, from a civil society perspective, from a non-governmental institution that works on public health, we now the efforts of the Lancet Commission in really drawing good lessons and, and enabling us as a global community in health to think about what needs to be done in the future. One really good thing that the commission did was not just to look at the health uh, system's impact, but also to think about what does this mean for economies and for social development of populations like countries and, and regions that are large. So one lessons, some of the lessons that, and observations from Africa is that COVID-19 re-emphasized the need to strengthen health systems, especially primary health care, um, alongside uh, building uh, higher levels of care. And in primary health care, worth noting is the need to really focus on strengthening preventive services, as well as health promotion efforts on, in different countries. These have lagged behind and largely have been left to be done through volunteer experiences. A lot of countries, like where I come from in Kenya, you have community health volunteers as opposed to community health workers. And therefore, there's a, a workforce that is ready to be deployed, ready to support our health systems, but it's expected to work on a voluntary basis. You'll have small pockets of compensation or stipends, but that doesn't work. There are countries that have invested in primary health care and invested in community health services on the African continent has proven that you can make progress even where you have very limited uh, limited in, uh, investments as a country or very limited resources as a country. Ethiopia is a good example. They have really included their community health services into formal health services, and that has helped um, the country make progress even where resources are very, very limited. Um, another lesson that we that to take away from the COVID-19 pandemic is that while governments are making efforts in PHC, they do need to reorganize the way they deliver services. And that sort of reorganization cannot be done without engaging key strategic um, partners. And partners here don't just mean uh, within the health sector, but also include communities, include private sector, include uh, multi-stakeholders because the response to health goes beyond uh, those in the health sector. It must go to other sectors. It must embrace agriculture, food security. It must also think about they, those who deal with infrastructure for purposes of access, accessibility and ensuring that um, health is well supported. Because in, in, I think in previous years, African governments have looked at health as a soft investment, quote unquote, um, it was seen as that sector that doesn't really deliver for the economy, but COVID taught African governments, and I think the world at large really had lessons that health is a, is, is a core part of economic and national development, and therefore it must be treated as such in channeling resources and in, 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 in investment. Um, another thing as I want to, to, we want to make recommendations is as we think about what does the future look like, there's need to revitalize policies around primary health care and that focus on strengthening health systems. The past has largely been focused on, yes, building the health system, but there's, there's been too many vertical processes and vertical investments that are either focused on responding to specific diseases or specific emergencies, but not leaving the health system building process behind. And that has cost a price. And that price has been decline of essential health services, especially with the impact of COVID-19. When you look at services like maternal and newborn child health, they took a huge hit. And that would have been avoided if both uh, system strengthening would go alongside uh, investment in, 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 in particles of directing services. In terms of thinking about what should the investment look like for the future, I think it's important to think about building efficiencies in resource allocation by African governments and strengthening uh, to strengthen health system expenditure. Many times you, you have budgets that are written on paper, but when you compare what is planned for against what is actually expended, you realize that there's, 
they are major gaps. So creating efficiencies and ensuring that the resource allocation and, and expenditure go hand in hand and prioritization goes to the right places. I've seen in many African countries where you, you, you have governments build health facilities and look at the standards and the ability of those health facilities to function is really challenged and that speaks to where are the prioritizations in terms of investment of it's important within Africa to build a strong either national or social insurance uh, health systems as a way of protecting people from catastrophic health costs and expenditures. Majority of services in Kenya are paid for from people's pockets, and these are particularly poor people paying or missing to access healthcare services because of costs. If you look at countries like where I come from in Kenya, you have about 40% of services being delivered in the private sector and the rest of about another 47 being delivered by the public system and then non-profits forming uh, the, the remainder. That speaks to the fact that while the population has limited resources, majority of them have to access services uh, through their pockets and that contributes to slowing down development at the family level as people prioritize resources for health against making uh, progress forward in terms of the economic standards. It's essential as the global players think about what kind of investments, what kind of systems need to be put into place, that uh, res international resources are well coordinated and that uh, the funds that are availed also build off each other. The, I hope and I truly think that COVID did teach us a lesson that donors, when they come into African countries, will more or less invest on what, what they, their priority are, if priorities are, or they will only invest in certain sections that doesn't help the system to move forward. I think it's essential that donors align better and back up country, country, country systems and invest in country systems, put up higher standards for efficiencies and for action for tracking what what is invested where it goes how what kind of results it produces so that there can be real progress on the connect on the continent and examples could be drawn from what the african development bank has stated in its current strategy that runs up to 2030 that they will invest where other funders are investing so that they can build on those resources to build strong primary health care systems i think that's an important one i agree with with the commission when you talk about building investments for human resources for health in on the African continent. And that needs to go further than just building capacity of people, but thinking and supporting governments to think about and to plan for retention of such human resource. There are two forms of drain, where it's internal drain, where people will leave like the public sector and go to do something different within their own countries, but also where people leave their country to go and work, especially in high income countries, that needs uh, to be thought through and systems co-developed and co-designed with African countries so that the issue of human resources can, can be addressed in a way that is sustainable and builds strong, strong systems. I think as I, as I come towards at the end, it's, it's important to think about what models of primary healthcare have worked well. Uh, lessons from possibly Brazil and Cuba could be helpful in terms of in, informing African countries in how they build primary healthcare services and ensure that they're well integrated and they can contribute to drive. Thinking about regional institutions, and, and I thank you so much, uh, EU CDC, for mentioning the work you're doing with the Africa CDC. It's important to strengthen regional institutions within the African continent, as they really are critical for driving the African response and strengthening African health systems, working in partners, catalyzing collaboration ac across countries, and really thinking about how do you create um, systems and policies that will work for multiple countries so that countries can also be able to share resources and can be able to benefit from specialized uh, uh, human capacity? For example, when it comes to regulation of medical products, that is essential to continue to do. A, a last point or two last points is to think about building Africa's manufacturing capacity. The fact that Africa stood at the back of the line in the, the, is a key highlight that Africa's manufacturing capacity needs to be accelerated, supported, and driven so that it can provide 
uh, fit for purpose uh, technologies for African communities and African people when it comes to improving health and well being. And finally, is to support African countries to build stronger data systems that really show the reality on the ground and those data systems to be sufficiently linked such that um, when they can even help share information across regions. If we look at the East African situation, Tanzania did not respond to COVID like all other countries. And there we are as neighbors, whether you're looking at, at Malawi, when you're looking at Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, all these are their neighbors. And the impact of such uh, different ways of responding do highlight the fact that it's essential to have strong data systems that help and help countries even to convince their neighbors that we need to be working together in terms of moving forward in response to, to health emergencies, but also in strengthening our systems. And I think I'll wrap it around by saying civil society remains a critical player. I am a member of the civil society engagement mechanism for UHC. Civil society did an incredible job during the pandemic of building trust with communities, of engaging and communicating to communities and encouraging governments to really step down the information that was complex so that communities could understand and could be able to take up the messaging that was needed, but also provided feedback upwards to, to government to say, this is where communities are at and this is where you should be going. So really calling for um, engaging as communities as partners in the global response to strengthening health systems, to pandemics, and to investments. Thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you very, very much, Ms. Rungu. And your call to civil society is extremely important and, and well heard. Thank you very much. Um, next, we'll hear our final presentation is from Mr. Martin Taylor, the Director of Health Systems and Services for the WHO Western Pacific Region. Mr. Taylor leads the division's work on health financing, health workforce, essential medicines and technologies, and he brings over 20 years of experience supporting countries to strengthen health systems. Thank you, Mr. Taylor, for sharing your insights into the health systems strengthening efforts of the Western Pacific Region of the WHO. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for um, inviting me. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, colleagues. And uh, first of all, a, a huge thank you to the Sustainable Development Solutions Network for organizing this webinar. It's actually, for me, preparing for this has been fantastic in terms of casting my mind back and thinking about so much that's happened in the last few years. And and I'd say that I think the, um, the Lancet Commission is fantastic for that, both in terms of summarizing very um, concisely a lot of what we did around the world, but also stimulating extra extra thoughts. In terms of what I'm going to say today for our Western Pacific region, for, first of all, a quick um, reminder, this is a hugely diverse region. Um, we have countries like China, we have some of the smallest Pacific islands in the world with populations of thousands, and in between that we have a lot of low middle income countries, for example, Cambodia, Laos, and we have high income countries, Australia, um, Korea, South Korea, Japan. So, so what I say does not refer to all of those countries, but some of the points that we pick are from a number of those countries that, that we've seen. Across our region, our response was broadly guided by the Asia Pacific strategy for emerging diseases and public health emergencies. And we're in the third iteration of this strategy. So member states have been using this for many years now to, to prepare. And of course, it has a lot of the basic principles in there about um, equity, about doing what we can with uh, no regrets to avoid um, preventable mortality, morbidity. Um, and of course, so, so that's guided a lot of what, what we've seen across the region. In terms of what I'm going to share now, I've grouped my reflections under five broad categories. And what I did when thinking back was looked at some of the actions we saw that strengthened systems, hopefully systems that would be of benefit in the longer term for achieving universal health coverage. So not just for the immediate short term for the emergency, but that could have lasting impact um, as a pointer for some of the things that went well, but also some of the areas where I feel that we missed opportunities um, and where there's a huge amount still to do. So. Five broad categories. First of all, this one is a really basic level one, but I think it's important to say 
a number of countries in our region went into this pandemic without some of the basic equipment that they needed. Um, oxygen supplies, um, PCR testing, um, laboratory capacity. And if you're a Pacific Island country with one intensive care unit and you don't have the capacity or the oxygen supplies there, you only need one case for your ICU to become overwhelmed and you have a problem preventing mortality. So I think that's an important point to note is that there's quite a lot of basic equipment that has been supplied to countries that is not just relevant for COVID, but for their longer term um, healthcare delivery. And of course, for future outbreaks. Secondly, moving up slightly in the scale, facilities and operational preparedness and management. One of the things that we noticed across our region was um, the uh, process that countries went through at the very practical delivery level of preparing their healthcare pathways with the referrals so that the right people could be treated at the right place at the right time. Vitally important when intensive care unit space is limited to make sure that we can prevent avoidable mortality. And in this area, we worked on what we would call in the red line, working with countries to try to identify when they were approaching the red line of their healthcare systems being overwhelmed and what they could do to try to optimize the healthcare system. Interesting in this was, of course, it puts a huge focus on referral systems. And this is something that we hope is going to have a longer term benefit in terms of referral systems between primary care and between specialist secondary and tertiary care in the future. But it also requires some quite careful thought in terms of not just the referral up the chain to the specialist care and the ICUs, but back out of that as well. And what we noticed actually was that in a number of countries in our region, especially when Omicron hit, some people were staying too long in those intensive care units and we weren't making the best use of that whilst other people were dying in corridors and at home not being admitted. So there were some certain benefits I think that we saw and some systems, proper systems work in strengthening how those systems would work and the referrals to try to maximize the efficiency of the healthcare system. Alongside that, of course, was work around inf infection prevention control, um, operational planning at, at a, a subnational level in terms of identifying the priority facilities, the use of digital tools, and of course, the planning for the ongoing delivery of other essential health services. All vital and very subnational, a lot of it. Next, I turn to some of the kind of behind the scenes systems work that was essential to make some of this frontline service delivery effective. Firstly, I think some of our unsung heroes in our region, those who work on the national regulatory authorities to make sure that new vaccines were available, licensed, regulated, and available in the country as soon as they could possibly be. And this is a huge challenge when you have stretch regulators um, without the capacity and the capability in their countries, especially the case in many of our Pacific Island countries. A huge amount of work was done and there was a lot of solidarity between regulators in the region, sharing the dossiers, sharing their information to be able to make sure that those vaccines could be available quickly. Um, another, another set of our unsung heroes, the legislators who had to work to update um, public health emergency legislation, the kind of legislation that outlines under what circumstances people can be asked to stay at home and who has the power authority to do that, what triggers that and how long that can be done for. Many countries in our region went into this pandemic with legislation from the 1940s, from the 1950s, some even from the 1920s. In a digital era, with what we know now, there's a huge task there. So some have already gone through that process of updating their legislation and many are still on that journey, but we've learned a lot from COVID to help guide us for the future on that. Um, and then I think another area where we saw some mixed progress in terms of systems is this linking of the public health side with the health care, curative care side. And we really noticed that as a huge challenge early on 
when you're contact tracing in the early stage of a wave to try to minimize and suppress as much as possible, it's absolutely vital to get those connections, to build the contact tracing capability, the surveillance and laboratory, and link that with the curative care. In many countries, I think we were a bit slow on that, and it took us some time. And then lastly, I think I'd say, obviously, we can't say anything in terms of the background systems without financing. This posed a huge challenge for many countries for a couple of reasons. First of all, in our region, um, financial protection is still a major challenge. Many countries, I think we're one of the worst, if not the worst, of all of the WHO regions for catastrophic health expenditure. We have many countries large, where large populations still pay out of pocket. This clearly is a disincentive for people who are sick or symptomatic presenting to healthcare systems when they know that they're going to have to pay out of pocket um, and also because of the other consequences um, that this could, could entail in terms of lost income, quarantine, etc. Um, so that also put huge budgetary challenges and many countries in our region actually were quite innovative in how they could access budgets, streamline public financial management um, to, to, to make services available to the population at no cost. And I think there are some lessons there that I hope we don't miss when we go forward in the challenges of financial protection and universal health coverage. Moving next from the some of those kind of background systems, the next area I think we should turn to is community engagement and risk communication. And I notice I think a number of the other speakers have already spoken quite a lot about, about this. This was absolutely vital um, and something that many countries in our region innovated with and tried to build up, but I think it was an area that we were particularly ill-prepared for, um, particularly ill-prepared for. And this, of course, was vital when we're talking about those vulnerable populations, um, those who um, are most at risk, often those who were most early affected um, with huge, uh, huge consequences. We've seen, and I hope we can sustain this, but we've seen in some countries that the investments that were put in around community engagement during COVID, in particular around mobilizing populations for vaccination, we're hoping that this can actually have a lasting benefit in terms of the engagement between primary healthcare and populations for future of healthcare delivery. One particular example that actually I just um, was, was reading about just a few days ago in Lao PDR. Um, some of the work on community engagement to increase um, COVID vaccination rates, which had, uh, depending on the parts of, of Lao PDR, um, increases of 5 to 16 percent. We're seeing it's translated now in terms of increasing antenatal care by up to 60 percent. So if we can sustain some of those innovations, um, that is a huge benefit, especially uh, in those rural areas and areas where people are afraid to, or for whatever reason, um, have barriers to access healthcare. Um, next, uh, after that, and, and the last of the broad areas I want to touch on, um, again, an area that's been spoken about by other speakers, um, COVID forced us to work with other parts of government in a way that we hadn't been forced to before, in a way that in the public health community, we knew we should, and we wanted to, but often we didn't quite know the language to do it or we couldn't find the time to do it. Um, and I think uh, ministries of finance is the first that comes to mind, not surprisingly. But in many countries in our region where healthcare is quite decentralized and the responsibilities and the authority and the mandates are quite decentralized, working with ministries of internal affairs, ministries of decentralizations, ministries of local government, and also the provincial governments themselves, the governors and the vice governors who are in charge of healthcare and who can link healthcare with other sectors was really vital. And um, on work that I was doing actually just a couple of weeks ago um, in Cambodia, supporting our Cambodia office, it's very clear to see that we still have, based on that work with local government around COVID, an opportunity to use that for stronger health systems for the future. And I don't know how long that window of opportunity will stay open, but I think it's incumbent upon us to make the most of it while we can. And while local governments still want to listen to us, the public health people, about how we can work together around common agendas and objectives. Turning now to some of the areas where I feel we probably missed some tricks, 
um, and where there's challenges for the future. Um, six, in no particular order of priority, at the first of all, equity and vulnerable populations. Um, I think it was revealed so much. We've done something. We had some successes. I think in, in many countries, we've managed to make sure that the elderly were first in the queue for vaccination. Um, but we know that there are many vulnerable populations which we didn't quite do enough for this time around. And when we think about that and the social determinants of health for the future, that's a huge challenge for us. Secondly, the healthcare workforce. Um, James spoke earlier about the numbers needed in, the, in, in, in his region. We have a similar challenge in numbers, but I think there's more actually for the healthcare workforce that, that we're seeing in our region, trying to make sure that they can have health workers can have a career that pays a decent living wage that is valued by the community and society that people want to go into and don't get burnt out in is a huge challenge. How we make that shift, I'm not quite sure, but COVID has revealed to us that we need to do something on that for our healthcare workers, and in particular, the nurses and the primary healthcare workers. Um, Third, I've mentioned a little bit about health financing already, financial protection, making sure there's enough investment in, in health. I don't think I need to say any more. That is going to maintain be a huge challenge for us. And in our region, from WHO perspective, we're going to continue to work um, in particular with the Asian Development Bank. We held a number of virtual meetings with health and finance ministers during COVID. We're planning a face-to-face -face one next year. Um, we know it's going to be difficult given the global financial situation at the moment, but we need to keep our eyes on the long term goals of the sustainable development goals um, for financial protection for healthcare. Uh, fourth, primary healthcare, um, being mentioned by others, um, and I think an area which is going to require um, some major investment and in thinking, particularly as we think about primary healthcare as the foundation for healthcare systems in the future. Fifth, and others have mentioned it, I think in particular, Dr. Aman mentioned this, um, data and surveillance, uh, forecasting, and bringing all of that together so that it is available in a real-time situation for those operational leaders and planners as they are making critical decisions on a daily basis. That was something that was really apparent, that we had some progress in being, uh, being able to make real-time data available for planners in some countries, but there's much more that we need to do. And then sixth, going back to one of the points earlier, actually making sure that we have all of those other links between the public health functions and the curative functions, um, I think is an area where at times we were making it up a little bit as we went along. Um, we need more thinking on how we can plan in advance for that. And the area of contact tracing was one that really was uh, in the early days vital. Um, and so in the early days for the future. So I think, I mean, from that in conclusion for our region, what I'd say is there's a lot of positives to learn from. There's a lot of positives that we need to make sure we don't slip back on and we try and sustain them for the future. But there are still some fundamental challenges there. And as we think about trying to get back on track for the sustainable development goals and for universal health coverage in our region, when we try to get back on track in terms of building healthcare systems that are based on the foundations of primary health care, can deliver universal health coverage and the public health functions. Um, there's a lot to do, but there's a lot to build on. And uh, certainly across our region, um, I think what we're seeing at the moment is that we still have the energy for that. The political windows are changing in different countries, but there's still an energy in the public health community, which we may need to tap into to make the most of it in the coming, coming months and years ahead. So thank you very much. And I'm looking very much forward to the discussion and the questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Taylor. So I'm going to hang it, hand it back to Professor Sachs to start the discussion off. Thanks to all of you. And what a great uh, discussion <clears throat> and a lot of wisdom. And I hope that uh, all of the students who are going to be viewing this uh, webinar in their classes uh, in, in the months ahead also will be studying carefully the things that uh, all of you are saying. There's a lot of commonality. Uh, questions of uh, finance came up everywhere. This is clear. Uh, even in rich countries, the questions uh, in some rich countries like my own, the United States, the questions of health coverage are pertinent. But in poor countries, 
uh, even in, in middle income countries, absolutely central is our catastrophic health costs covered, our basic primary health costs covered. Is there uh, a, a primary health system in a low income setting that can actually function or is the underfinancing so serious? The question of human resources uh, is essential. Uh, and uh, thank you for the observations of, that many of you made about the quality of work, decent compensation, uh, and as uh, Pauline said, compensation period, because why is it that the community health workers in Africa who do heroic work, and I've watched uh, in person, face to face, why is this a voluntary sector uh, of course uh, it's it's heroic that it is but this is a skilled workforce that's absolutely essential and needs to be on a proper payroll and the basic answer is governments don't have the budgets for it and traditionally have relied on this kind of volunteerism but that's why we're calling for a global health fund with an explicit window to fund this uh, crucial part of the workforce and others in the primary health sector. So finance uh, essential. All of you spoke about the challenges of cross sector work because I think health uh, ministers and finance ministers probably talked to each other more in the last couple of years than probably in the 20 years before that. Uh, although health finance is always central to a budget it was absolutely urgent uh, at uh, at this point i'd like to ask you uh, all of you to reflect on two questions uh, one to what extent was there real regional cooperation um, it seems to me in the asia pacific from what i could see the fact that there was an asia pacific strategy actually in its third variant uh, because of SARS probably uh, being so vivid in memory, uh, as well as other pandemics uh, that came afterwards, or not pandemics, but epidemics that came, uh, NEPA and MERS and uh, H1N1 and others, uh, the Asia Pacific at least seems to have had a real, re true regional strategy. But of course, when the pandemic hit, it seemed to me that it was assumed by political leaders everywhere that this was a national issue. Uh, this was not a regional issue. So the question was, was anybody listening at a regional level? Because the politicians who are not expert in this, but suddenly were in the in the front line, seemed to go in their varied directions based on their hunches, their beliefs, their whatever, uh, or what they were being advised, but not necessarily regionally. So I'd, I'd like just a reflection in in the Africa case, Europe, uh, uh, PAHO, uh, and, and of course in the Asia Pacific, to what extent was there a regional strategy and to what extent did it matter uh, uh, in fact? And the other thing that I'd like to ask a reflection on is this question of public communication. In most cases, I think the, politi the politicians had the lead in communication. What they knew or didn't know about public health really varied. We saw a lot of strange cases, uh, a lot of uh, politicians that fed so much misinformation or so much confusion. What do we do about this? Uh, and how do we build the communications trust? Because really it's one of the lessons of this uh, I am a fan. I've long been a believer in this. Uh, I think you wear uh, face masks when you have an ongoing pandemic. But even that became a, a absolutely most contested battleground of this pandemic, partly because of the communications issues. People didn't understand it. In the US, we were first told, don't wear them, then do wear them. It, it, was, it really was a confusion. Um, and uh, I'd just like your reflection on how to build the trust really on an operational basis and 
how to, in, in a crisis, how are we going to do better in, in that communications challenge? So I, I know there are a lot of other questions uh, in, in, in the queue, but uh, those are the ones that I would uh, like to start with. Uh, again, remembering that we're going to have lots of students and policymakers and others viewing this uh, for months to come. Uh, what can we learn about regional cooperation when viruses cross borders, when workers cross borders uh, uh, daily, as, uh, as Andrea uh, mentioned uh, so wisely? What do we do about this regional cooperation issue? And, and then second, what do we do about the trust in communications? And I think uh, anyone could jump in and, and start, and then uh, I'd, I'd love uh, the reflections of each of you. Maybe, maybe and Andrea, you would start, yeah. Uh, these are really very, very crucial questions. Um, now to the co regional cooperation. At the beginning, there wasn't any. Uh, uh, countries sort of withdrew to, to, to themselves. They, 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 they stopped even um, uh, the export of critical uh, um, uh, goods like, like uh, uh, PPE and so forth. But they quickly realized that they are that we are in the in, in interdependent, and um, I think uh, for for our region the, the the best example of cooperation was really the joint procurement of the vaccines, because we have um, uh, our, uh, the size of our our uh, countries goes from 80, 80 something million to uh, below one million. And these small countries would never ever have a chance to get anything. So that was certainly uh, something where also the bigger countries that could have, um, of course, negotiated any, any um, uh, um, uh, contracts for vaccines, they waited until the, the consensus building among 27 uh, countries was done and the contracts were, were, were declared so that we could start all in the whole region uh, uh, at the same time. There was, were other parts of the cooperation that were working very well and that was the exchange of patients uh, or the, the, um, the transfer of patients when uh, the, the services in one country were overwhelmed, there, were, um, uh, uh, there was very quickly a mechanism how to, to um, um, uh, offer uh, beds in other countries uh, and how to transfer the patients. So that worked also very well. Um, uh, they did the border issue with the with the, the closures that took a bit longer, um, uh, and um, I, I'm not sure it um, uh, it really worked. Uh, but um, uh, countries had some agreement and understanding how this how this would go. So I think there was a, a process of being uh, focused on oneself to the recognition we have to work together. Now there are certainly improvements to be done and now there are several several reviews looking into how this uh, response was and how it can be further improved. Regarding the, co uh, the, the communication, I think um, in principle the situation highlighted what theory already knew that in where there is big uncertainty, uh, it's very difficult to communicate. Um, and uh, that is true for the politicians, but also true for our scientists, because I found um, uh, that uh, also my experts were very reluctant to communicate if they didn't have any evidence. And I said, yeah, well, but we have to, to give the politicians something because they will make any some decisions. So we have to give them something. And here, I think uh, it's, it's what I, uh, the second part is the understandability uh, uh, of our messages and also the political messages uh, so that, that it, it fits into the context of people. And here, I think we can learn what I meant before with the community engagement so that we engage with those community authorities and leaders to help us to translate our messages in, in, in ways that the community understands. 
Um, and that is then also, in my uh, view, a, a way how to build the trust. If you ex can explain what is happening, that the, the scientific evidence is changing, but in, in ways and in, in, uh, that, that is understandable and not just in technical jargon, uh, then I think there is a trust. And uh, there were examples that some countries, uh, even their prime ministers did this very well, uh, where the, the, the adherence of the public to measures was then, was then much better. Over. Oops, sorry, I'm on mute, the, uh, the endless mistake. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe, Pauline, uh, you could uh, reflect on the Africa CDC and, and uh, what kind of cooperation uh, you found and, and should be promoted. Thank, thank you so much. And thank, thank you, Dr. Amon, for highlighting uh, those points, really critical. In terms of uh, cooperation, I think regional cooperation that played out uh, as a good example in Africa was through the African CDC. I think really COVID-19 gave an opportunity to the Africa CDC to really stand up and execute its mandate and become a leader in terms of uh, not just pandemic response, but driving the overall disease response and public health in Africa. So just uh, two quick examples from the Africa CDC. The establishment of the Africa Vaccine Acquisition Task Team was really critical in bringing together African countries to think about and plan for how to access vaccines together as a regional, you know, as a, as a region. And that has helped countries access vaccines in ways that would not have been possible if they were not negotiating as individual countries. Um, the, the second part, and not, and not just a, a, a getting access to vaccines, but also thinking about when countries have excess or if vaccines are just about to expire, what, what do you do? How do you reduce and channel them? So that's, that's really been a, a, a major outcome and a good outcome out of uh, this, uh, this whole COVID pandemic. There's, the second piece for, to the Africa CDC is, the CDC hosted regular dialogues to think about critical topics and to engage players from across the African continent particularly from governments and, and lead agencies to, to discuss, share lessons, explore what could be done and what isn't working, what has worked well. And, and those lessons have been really important in terms of moving the response to the pandemic forward. The third piece is the Africa CDC has now established a, a conference on public health in Africa that enables uh, Africans to come together, also bring in international partners to discuss uh, public health issues in Africa in a very targeted and structured way. That conference the, the, is the first physical and will take place in Rwanda coming week. So I hope uh, a lot of us will find ourselves there. And I think it's a really important space for the, for the African continent to ask itself, what do we do, do about our public health concerns? Because the continent has a history of being you know, plagued by various diseases, various epidemics, um, on now a rising concern of non-communicable diseases. How do we address all this as Africans and have a response that works for the citizens of Africa? I think linked to that is um, also the issue of Work, accelerating work for regulatory uh, system strengthening for medical products in Africa. It's been an initiative that's been running for years and it's been a slow process, but I think COVID-19 provided an impetus for people to really focus and say, Africa does need to strengthen its regulatory systems. We cannot do it as individual countries to as much as we would love to, but it makes sense for us to work together <clears throat> as institutions. So a lot of countries have now come in and signed on what they call the Africa Medicines Agency. It's at a level where it really is, is good to go. And the uh, location for, for, for hosting is already in place. It will be hosted by Rwanda, the government of Rwanda. And those are outcomes that have come, that has stemmed out of cooperation on the continent. And finally, for the for cooperation is uh, the dialogue and steps towards building Africa's manufacturing capacity. 
and I think uh, Dr. Amon, the EU CDC, is working very closely with 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 Africa CDC to build manufacturing uh, capacity, uh, the, 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 to build systems that enable Africa to to do manufacturing. I think I, 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 I step that you know COVID came with a lot of challenges, but there are some good things that happened out of this. When PPEs were really difficult to access from uh, from importation, African companies stood up and started manufacturing masks. So now you see really good quality masks that are coming out of African uh, industries. And similarly, uh, you know, products like syringes that have supported uh, African countries to be able to deliver vaccines. So all these are coming out of the need to take care of our people, but recognizing that there are certain hindrances that have been in place. And this is an opportunity for manufacturing in Africa to, move, or to really move forward. And maybe just a quick comment on building public um, trust in communications. I think I'll, I'll, I'll pull an example from Kenya and, and, and many other countries like Uganda. Public communications was, was not just driven by political leaders, but I think in Kenya, the, the political leaders stepped back and allowed technical leaders within the ministries of health to communicate consistently to communities. So two things, technical leaders, with the right knowledge and information communicating communities and then the consistency of communication. Many times, in, I think in previous years, we've had like start stop, but I think that start stop creates opportunity for filling the gap when there is the stop. The consistency with COVID was amazing. Of course, there were some con messages that, you know, were counterproductive, but uh, largely people took the messages seriously and listened to government. There's, there's much more trust in government messages in public health now than I think than we've had in the past. There was also a lot of innovation around uh, public communication, some old methods where people would go around the, the rural areas, especially the estates with gramophones and you know, talk to people. It's important for you to take one, two, three steps, wear your mask, wash your hands, you know, do this and that to prevent COVID. But also when it came to, to vaccines, there's been a lot of public communications using the regular methods that you know somehow had gotten discarded. That that would say there'll be a vaccination center in Point X. I think my first vaccine that I took, if I had that message on a on on somebody who went around estates and said we've set up a center at X point, so now you don't have to go to the main facility. You can come to this center, and people queued up in those centers to to get their their vaccination. And I think also leveraging technology. One thing we, we did as an, an organization allow me to speak about this uh, was to set up um, the, the, the director general of health in Kenya came to us and said, I need a communications person and communication support. I need to communicate better to communities and communities and use technologies. And we set up what we called hashtag ask the DG. And this was a Twitter handle that enabled the DG to dedicate one hour every week to answering questions from, from people generally. So people would post, where can I get my, my COVID test? What do I need to do? Do masks work? Do vaccines um, from, what are the side effects? All these critical questions. And the DG was very consistent working with a technical team behind him in responding to these questions on, 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 a, on a weekly basis. He built a lot of traffic and a lot of trust that he's accessible. He can respond to technical questions, even if they're coming from anybody in the country. And combine that with, with the Facebook messaging that then would provide additional information. Then of course, mass media usage. So multiple channels, but technical people providing that right from information and under the support of partners. And, once it was COVID messaging were going out, we also built in components of essential health services so that people could, could be able to say, where can I go for antenatal care? Facilities are largely closed. Where should they go? And that was, was being answered. So these are some ways that are really important for communicating and building public trust. So I think let me pause there and thank you very much. Crystal clear. Thank you very, very much. Extremely helpful. Lots, lots of powerful lessons there. Uh, Martin, uh, may uh, you come in now? And then James. Thank you. Um, yeah, two, two, two excellent questions. So a, a 
three three reflections in terms of regional cooperation. Um, the first, uh, you, I mean, you you spoke quite uh, generously about cooperation in our region, but um, we noted, of course, when it came to establishing travel restrictions and import and export um, restrictions related to that, countries went it alone. Um, so at that kind of political level, those decisions were make, made quickly and in isolation. What we did see, though, was um, I think a lot of, of regional cooperation at the clinical and the scientific and the technical level um, between experts in their fields. Um, and that uh, was certainly the case very early on as um, scientists were sharing as we were learning more about the virus and the uh, how it presented and how the disease uh, presented and progressed in, in population. So there was a lot of that early on. Um, and it and it and it continued. Um, I mentioned also uh, earlier the kind of the regulatory authority um, solidarity across our region, particularly in the small island states in the Pacific. Um, the third area I'd note, of course, was and maybe we call this sub-regional even um, countries. Some of the larger countries in the region um, supporting the Pacific island countries who were very isolated, had little purchasing power. Um, so whether we're talking about essential medicine, uh, sorry, emergency medical teams going to those countries, um, provision of PPE, sharing of vaccines. So there was that kind of sub-regional bilateral or to a number of countries across the region um, cooperation that was extremely important for those Pacific Island countries, extremely important in their response. Um, on uh, public communication, I think, I mean, I, I agree a lot with what's been said by Dr. Amon and, and, and Pauline already. So I, I won't repeat that. I mean, uh, two points to, to highlight. Um, one, when we're thinking about communication, it's vitally important to do the listening, to do the listening at what's being said on shared on social media, um, in, in other platforms, to understand where your populations are, to help segment and think about the different audiences. Um, and we certainly expanded within WHO, but I think a number of countries in our region did our listening capability throughout the course of the, um, the pandemic. In particular, when we're dealing, for example, with vaccine hesitancy, to be able to distinguish the different categories of vaccine hesitance because they're not all the same um, and something can be done on that. And then the, the, the second point, um, uh, who, who has influence? Um, Paul in touch, I think, on the, the vital importance of civil society in that in re that regard. But who do populations listen to? And then building alliances with who the populations listen to, who do the population trust, um, was vitally important. Thank you. Back over to you. E excellent. Thank you so much. And uh, to James for uh, the Americas. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Professor Sachs. And, and just to really compliment what, what others have said, I think, you know, uh, the issue of cooperation, um, solidarity, um, it's a mixed bag, um, I think, in the Americas. Um, you know, we, we have we've seen some good experiences um, through countries coming together once a month, ministers of health convening once a month through PAHO to discuss the current context, get updates. Uh, weekly briefings, um, sharing of, of uh, surveillance data. Uh, these are all, I think, very good experiences. Uh, another good experience I think that we saw was how um, the external relations um, uh, sectors within, within the countries really mobilized and worked collectively in some areas, taking this issue of uh, particularly access to uh, PPEs, diagnostics, and vaccines to a whole other level. This was all led not by ministries of health, but in particular by the departments of, of foreign affairs or their equivalents in countries. Um, this raised it to a whole other discussion, a uh, whole other level of discussion uh, within, obviously, the UN system with WHO and, and bilaterally amongst uh, countries. So I think that that in itself was a good experience. Um, I think the the somewhat um, somewhat negative aspects relate, relates to the fact that everybody is, you know, it was a zero sum game at the, at, at the beginning. Everybody is scurrying for the same uh, products of limited availability, the closure of, um, 
um, the closure of borders. Um, the I, I was, you know, we have been somewhat, um, um, I think, positively critical, if I can put it that way, of the mechanisms that have been established uh, through the consortiums at the global level uh, to ensure the supply of um, of equipment and diagnostics. Um, the considerations around equity in the decision making of some of those mechanisms and how many countries in the Americas really felt that they were left behind, not just in the allocation frameworks, but also subsequently in, in decisions uh, relating to the distribution of vaccines through COVAX um, as a consequence of, I think, unilateral decisions that were taken also by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I, we refer here to, I think, decisions where um, perhaps uh, bilateral uh, bilateral agreements were favored as opposed to um, commitments to COVAX, which ultimately meant that those that really needed vaccines um, didn't get them. Um, so this is a real concern, I think, for, for countries uh, in the region, and, and we're very aware, we're working with them, because as you know, we have the, the true revolving fund mechanisms at PAHO, um, the vaccine revolving fund that supplies over a billion dollars of vaccines for priority programs to to um, to our countries, and then the strategic fund for medicines, and 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 both were very active and and really grew. One other area I think um, of very good cooperation related to um, the educational and digital digital educational um, sharing of information and 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 the platforms that were utilized. Um, we saw an exponential growth in demand for state-of-the-art knowledge, um, clinical guidance, um, uh, patient management through uh, digital uh, platforms. Uh, and we ourselves at the PAHO virtual campus um, with now over 2 million health workers um, participating actively in, in, um, in courses within the platform. And, and we delivered um, through, you know, during the pandemic uh, to over 1 million health workers, 26 different courses on COVID-19. Um, and so this was really a, a success story that we believe um, uh, can be replicated also in other regions. And it's a very good and positive, um, I think, initiative to, to converge uh, technical guidance around care and treatment and management within the context of health emergencies while reaching directly into health services. And I think this is something to look at. Finally, on the um, on the trust issue, one of the biggest concerns I think we have relates to, um, uh, and I think this is globally, we've seen the UNICEF report relates to immunization, and um, not just in COVID nineteen, but how the COVID nineteen situation has exacerbated them uh, also uh, a continuing lack of trust uh, in vaccines and debilitating immunization programs. So we we are this is going to be a priority for. For the incoming director uh, of PAHO, we know that Dr. Jarvis Barbosa, um, and and how we approach that, it will have to be multi multifaceted from from the primary healthcare approach, um, but looking also at certain aspects of of, of behavioral science, um, the impact of social media, um, and then just basic public health. Uh, re really retaking the issue of core public health functions and education of health workers. One of the real areas of concern we saw in the Caribbean was whereby um, we noted a complete lack of trust uh, in COVID-19 vaccines amongst uh, nurses in particular. And so how can we deliver COVID-19 vaccines if we can't even get our health workers to trust in them? Um, so these are some of the issues I think that we, we have to address uh, moving forward. Thanks very much. Excellent, uh, everybody. Thank you. Uh, we're coming to the close of the session, uh, but uh, Julie, I think, probably has uh, one or two questions uh, for one or two of you, and then I'll wrap up uh, for everybody. But I think we've uh, we've heard a lot of uh, very important uh, wisdom for our agenda for 2023. So I'll, I'll conclude on that note. But Julie, over to you. Excellent. So I just want to ask one quick two part question about health workers. Um, so from the audience, we received a question asking about um, why high income countries have um, not been able to train enough health workers for the, their needs and then end up actually sort of poaching um, poor country health workers um, who come to the higher income countries for many different reasons. And the second part of that is understanding that 
the issue of human resources for health is also about training and education. So what are the efforts that multilateral and regional organizations are taking to help fund and strengthen health workforce education, um, especially in low and, low and middle income countries? So anybody can take that up. Sure, Dr. Ramon. Yeah, maybe I, I start. Um, now the, the matter is not that we don't train enough uh, in uh, of of our our uh, uh, people for 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 these services, the pr the problem is that they don't stay, um, and that is uh, the the um, uh, the reasons are of course manifold. But uh, uh, Ms. Taylor has 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 mentioned them. They see uh, that um, uh, health care workers, especially nurses, especially in long-term care facilities, um, but even more in public health, because public health in the healthcare sector is really the lowest part. Um, uh, they, they, they don't have a career, they often can, cannot uh, uh, even do a living, uh, uh, make a living uh, in some countries. And, and uh, then the training alone that uh, so we um, we have, I mean, we are focusing only on public health, of course, but we have a training program where we train people uh, from countries where they either never go back or when they go back, they go in the private sector um, where they got to get a lot more money. So in the end, uh, the training uh, does, didn't help. So here, I think it's really something beyond what we as a public health uh, institution can do. It's the salary structure and the revision of the whole whole system of uh, where these um, uh, professions are placed um, uh, that that will help and uh, of course the attractiveness of of of, of uh, positions in the high uh, income countries will uh, only increase if we if we do um, if we increase the salaries and the uh, the uh, um, uh, that make them more attractive for for healthcare workers in in low and middle income countries so i think this has to be um, uh, uh, equally done with a strengthening of the health uh, workforce in in the countries. Now, for the um, our work program with the African is also uh, the the uh, public public health workforce training in Africa, where there are many efforts. Uh, that are now uh, the Africa CDC tries now to bring together uh, so that uh, first of all it can be more coordinated um, uh, and and uh, maybe then also uh, it, it, it is better better visible where uh, specific efforts will be needed in the future. Excellent, thank you. Um, perhaps for just one final question um, we'd like to ask about data. So uh, many of the speakers today have talked about the importance of accurate real-time data and modeling on infections, disease burden, and deaths during the COVID pandemic. Um, what are the strategies that we can employ to collect the important data on these metrics and make sure that it is used to inform policy and public health interventions? Um, anybody would like to speak to that? Please, Mr. Taylor. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll say a quick word on that. Um, and then if I may also a quick word on the previous question. Um, so one of the one of the things that we noticed um, during during the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic is, is that we at times, I apologize, I'm in a hotel room and they're ringing, I don't know why. Um, uh, was um, we uh, we were at times awash with data, too much data, but the question was which data do we need for the critical decisions that needed to be taken at the time, and I think that is a kind of a vital part of this in terms of understanding uh, what your policy decisions are, which data they depend upon, and then do we have those data sources? Um, and one of the gaps that we noticed in a number of countries in our region. Um, was the the data around um, hospital utilization, getting real time data on hospital utilization, and in particular breaking that down into ICUs was vital. Um, so I think there's a a number of of aspects to this, but the the important part is 
what's the policy or operational decision you're taking and what data do you need to help you in, in, inform you on that? Um, if I may quickly on the health workforce question, um, this is this is an incredibly complex one, and I think it's one where we're going to need uh, a lot of thinking and discussion in the coming years, because this has been an issue that's been around for many decades. It's not new. Um, and I'm in a region where the Philippines um, positively encourages the export of nurses around the world um, and has been waiting desperately for borders to reopen or was waiting desperately for borders to reopen to be able to recontinue that. Um, and then we've got Pacific Island countries now raising a very loud voice in the last few months because of their loss of healthcare workers. So um, I, I don't really have a direct di direct answer to your question, but it's, it's very complex. I think it also is possibly linked um, with the fact that preparing the health work for the health workforce is a long term endeavor. You're, you're not preparing for next year, you're preparing for eight, 10, 15 years ahead. Um, and that's not very consistent with the political cycles of many governments in the high income countries. Over. Uh, please, Dr. Amon. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to monopolize this, but I think for the data, um, I, I agree you need uh, to have objectives that you, that you need data for and that the data uh, uh, fulfill. But I want to go on the real time. I mean, real time, I don't, I think it's important to define what is meant by this, because even if we catch the data as soon as they enter the system via laboratory diagnosis or medical diagnosis, it's not real time because there is a, a certain period has uh, elapsed since the infection has occurred. And that depends on the incubation period and uh, uh, healthcare seeking behavior and what, what uh, uh, um, and other um, uh, uh, aspects. So real time is not giving us a real picture on when the infection occurs. It's always a bit retrospective. We should keep this in mind that we don't create expectations um, uh, that, uh, that uh, we cannot meet. Uh, of course, uh, if you catch it immediately when there is a lab diagnosis by electronic health records or whatever, uh, then you shorten the reporting delay. That that is the the, the gain that you can 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 get. But uh, a certain uh, lapse uh, will always be there. Let me uh, close uh, our our session by thanking all of you for your leadership and for your clarity uh, in in this webinar. We will uh, be using this, what, posting it, of course, and a summary of, uh, of, of uh, the session, and also using it extensively in education programs uh, around the world in the 1,700 member institutions of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. We'll also be strongly engaged, and I, I hope and expect, together with all of you, in 2023 on furthering this agenda. Uh, there's no doubt that uh, we're going to be debating these issues, especially uh, health finance, but also I think uh, all of you emphasize the career paths of health workers, the, the training, the new ways of training, the possibility of using online training, which I think is extremely important, obviously, because of the reach and what PAHU has done. I, I hope can be generalized worldwide and uh, SDSN would like to help carry that forward, uh, but also uh, the proper compensation and uh, basic funding of, uh, of the health workforce as an absolutely vital component of, uh, of, of the national health systems. Well, I know that this is going to be uh, central at the World Health Assembly. It's going to be central on the continuing discussions of the G20 on SDG financing. The uh, preparedness funding is still being mobilized, but I, I hope will be mobilized in a much broader context uh, than it has been discussed so far, rather than a standalone fund as part of this bigger uh, picture. And all that you've added in insights to this, I think will will very much support that cause. So let me uh, give uh, thanks to all of you. Thanks to the participants. Uh, and uh, 
thanks to all the students who are going to be uh, learning from this uh, in, in the months ahead. Uh, my gratitude to the team at the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network for facilitating this webinar and let me wish uh, everybody uh, a good day and very happy holidays and a very happy and healthy 2023. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.